This is just a typical morning of eating some cereal with lactose-free milk as I watch some videos on the internet using closed captioning while looking up directions to my MRI appointment. Okay, maybe not really typical, but just about everything here, the milk, the TV, the graphics cards, the internet, the closed captioning, the GPS, the MRI machine, were made possible because of government investments. It's probably the case that every technology used today, at some point there was like government funding involved. And the latest technology that the US government is getting involved in is manufacturing microchips. Folks, we need to make these chips here in America. It's low off. President Biden just signed a bill into law today boosting domestic semiconductor production. There are some big companies that are set to benefit. If it's a good idea to make the semiconductors here, why do we need the government to help us? Here's why the US government is giving private companies billions of dollars and why many economists are calling the CHIPS Act a return to industrial policy. Industrial policy is actually quite a simple term. It's a set of policies that try to affect the outcome of some particular industry or industries. Industrial policy can be done through things like tariffs that make US-made products cheaper than foreign ones, or through tax incentives, like getting money back if you put solar panels on your house, or what has been less popular in recent years, direct investments. Let's go back way back to Alexander Hamilton. In 1790, Hamilton proposed tariffs on imported goods in order to encourage his fellow countrymen to buy more American products. This is the immense plant which gave birth to the atomic bomb and brought the world to a new crossroad. Fast forward to the 20th century to prevent the spread of radioactive contaminants used during the Manhattan Project. The US government funded the development of the HEPA filter, which is used in many air purifiers sold today. World War II also required enormous investment in radio technology, shipbuilding, and jet engines. The Defense Department was largely the main buyer of many of these technologies. The commercial market was quite small, the defense market was quite big, and so they could really drive a lot of the movement in industry. In the 1960s, the U.S. government spent more money on research and development than all other governments, all foreign private companies, and all U.S. private companies combined. Why? The Cold War and the space race. What did the space program give us? It gave us Tang. From Gemini to the shuttle to Earth families. Great mornings have taken off with Tang. Yeah, it gave us Tang, but it also gave a gazillion other things. It wasn't talked about as industrial policy. It was talked about as space policy or defense policy or health policy. But it was a de facto industrial policy. And lift off. A de facto industrial policy with many unforeseen benefits. This robotic prosthetic leg is powered by small, powerful motors originally designed for a robotic arm on the International Space Station. Like many of these technologies, semiconductors originated from research and development programs funded by the U.S. taxpayer. The birth of semiconductors in the United States had a lot to do with the fact that the Department of Defense and the space program were the first big early customers for semiconductors. Since 2006, China has prioritized catching up to the West technologically, but doing that requires semiconductors. China has ramped up its investment in chips. Senator Mark Warner, who is the chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, has long been warning about the growing threat posed by China. China has been able to throw literally, you know, two, three, four times as much money at trying to build up their semiconductor chip capacity as the United States. This is where the CHIPS Act comes in. The legislation offers $53 billion in direct investment plus a separate tax incentive program to reinvigorate the U.S. chip industry. So what the CHIPS bill did was say, we're going to take $52 billion, but we're going to take about $40 billion of that and try to get the semiconductor factories that are called fabs, get the fabs to locate here in America. Today, the U.S. still dominates the most lucrative links in the semiconductor supply chain, including the design of chips. But the fabrication of chips has increasingly moved to China, South Korea, and Taiwan. Over the last 20 years, um, a lot of that industry has migrated to East Asia, where land and labor are cheaper, and there are a lot of subsidies available. Because of this, the U.S. share of global chip making has shrunk from 37% in 1990 to 12% in 2020. China went from zero to about 15% in the same time. If we don't do this, I don't think there'll be another chip manufacturing facility built in America. Senator Warner sees this as a national security issue. Over the last particularly 15 or 20 years, 
What we've seen is that national security is no longer who has the most military hardware, but also who controls what technology domains. The U.S. now buys more than 90 percent of its advanced chips from Taiwan, an island China sees as its territory. Any conflict in Taiwan could dramatically disrupt global chip supplies. We all saw what happened during the pandemic when chip factories shut down overseas. We can never let that happen again. We have never before been in this kind of a Cold War type conflict with a power that was also a worthy economic peer. And I think it has awakened in the United States an awareness that we cannot simply allow the private market to allow vital technologies and capabilities to entirely migrate to a country that we are in an adversarial situation with. So our competitors are pouring tens of billion dollars into boosting their own supply of these essential semiconductors. And the United States needs to keep up and to compete. The vast majority of our colleagues agreed that this was an important and critical task. When it was passed, the CHIPS Act received rare bipartisan support. The yeas are 64, the nays are 33. There is broad bipartisan agreement that um, China is the challenge of our time and that in these areas of technology, we can't allow America to fall behind. Critics of industrial policy accuse it of picking winners rather than letting the free market determine which companies succeed. Some of the most famous industrial policy failures include investment targeted at a single company. At former President Donald Trump's urging, in 2017, Taiwan's Foxconn Technology Group promised to build a flat panel display factory in Wisconsin. This is a great day for American workers and for everyone who believes in the concept and the label made in the USA. But five years later, and that factory remains unbuilt. Critics of industrial policy also point to Solyndra. When it's completed in a few months, Solyndra expects to hire a thousand workers to manufacture solar panels and sell them across America and around the world. But in 2011, the solar manufacturer went bankrupt after it defaulted on $535 million in federal loans. But proponents of the CHIPS Act say it's not about picking specific firms like Intel or Taiwan Semiconductor. Good industrial policy funds a variety of firms, big, small, even foreign, as long as they're doing the work in the U.S. and they're not our adversaries. The ability to apply for this money is drawing major investment from these firms right now. Both Intel and TSMC are spending billions to build new fabs in the U.S. I think one thing we're going to learn is that industrial policy is expensive and we have large government deficits. And so I think one of the things that will uh, put the brakes on the rush to industrial policy is the fact that you'll have to persuade, you know, Congress to vote for this money, and that's not easy to do. The Republican senators, for example, who gave their support to the CHIPS Act, they did so because they saw this as a narrow exception to their general mistrust of the government being able to spend money better than the free market. And I think that there will not be many other industries that meet that test.